Well, I'm Chuck Teague, and I'm delighted to welcome you to Gettysburg. Uh, we do, again, about a dozen programs a day in different parts of the field, and today we call this First Shots on McPherson's Ridge. I want to go back, actually, in prehistory to try to understand this ground before we get into the battle itself. The ground rules the battle in the Civil War, but why did the ground come to be as it is? It's very important to understand. And the reality is that uh, some 400 million plus years ago, uh, the ground was shifting, and as it was shifting, uh, it was causing an, an uprising of ground in the far distance. And you can see, really, the extension of the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia, uh, which is that ground out there. And then, uh, the, as the tectonic plates are moving and the ground is shifting up, there will be ripples coming out from, from that mountain. And we refer to ridges and swales, ridge high point of swale, ridges and swales, just like waves coming uh, from the west in this direction. And that's going to be pr prove important in the battle to understand. Also to understand is, of course, that this area was originally pretty well wooded. And when uh, the charter was given to William Penn, who was an Englishman, uh, he would refer to this and others would as Penn's Woods, Pennsylvania, as we know now. By 1863, a lot of that had changed because when settlers came into the area, they began to clear ground to make it productive. There would be some disputes as to whether you're in Pennsylvania or might even be in Maryland because there was another charter down there and there was not a clear definitive line as between it and you had some people from Maryland who were settling in this area and claiming to be from Maryland and uh, they would begin to, well, resolve that dispute through a two surveyors, Lewis and Clark, uh, not those surveyors, they're more famous, but uh, uh, of course the ones who would be delineating the line between Pennsylvania and Maryland. Pardon me? Mason and Dixon. Mason and Dixon, that's exactly right. So surveyors are very important in this era, uh, America, trying to draw the lines and where, what is where, and we ended up to be in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania was, uh, again, an, an Englishman had the charter, but the, the Settlement of Pennsylvania was largely done by, by Scotch-Irish and Germans. Uh, Scotch-Irish, very evident in the names that you find around here, as was as with the Germans. And when they would settle, again, they would clear the land pretty much. Uh, you're standing on the boundary line between, well, one of Scotch-Irish heritage here. Uh, this is Edward McPherson, and over there would be John Herbst, John Herbst, the German. Uh, by the way, I want to clarify from the beginning that I've been mistaken, had been for many years until I met a good friend, became a good friend, uh, sadly died this last year, but he corrected me, as I've often been corrected. And he said, Chuck, there is no fear in McPherson. He was of McPherson. He was a descendant of McPherson's. And so it's not McPherson, it's McPherson. It's a Scotch-Irish, it's a proud Scotch-Irish name here. And again, Jan Herbst would have that property there. And this fence line that goes along here, Pennsylvania would require that you have fence lines between your boundaries. And this one marks the difference between McPherson and, and Herbst. Now, as the uh, development of the land would continue, several things would happen. One of which, of course, is road system would go through. And two roads would cr pass through the mountains. One, some of you may have been on, which is the Fairfield Hagerstown Road. That goes west, one of the early roads. And another one is to the north. And I uh, can't quite see it, but it's this side of Oak Hill, and it's called the, the Mumisburg Road. This road nearby, which is uh, the Cashtown or Chambersburg Road, came later. It came about uh, 1810, and it came as a toll road. It was a paved road. Well, paving not with asphalt, but uh, a macadam surface, which basically crushed rock, rolled, and, and with some binder to try to hold it together. Uh, there was a farm lane that went along here, and so what became the McPherson homestead. You can see the barn, the house sadly burned down after the battle. I think, I think it was about 1890. Uh, but the farm lane here accessed another, another lane across there. Farm lanes connecting the two roads heading west. But with the uh, big push to the west and go west young man, they wanted to have routes that were more improved. So with carriages and wagons and whatnot you could. And that brings us to the, to the Pike, and we have three pikes coming into Gettysburg. Pikes are, are roads that are, that are improved. We talk about 10 roads coming into Gettysburg, but most of them really were still dirt roads. The Chambersburg-York Pike uh, and uh, uh, the 
Chambersburg Pike, the Baltimore Pike, those three were, were improved. And so we have, again, the road system like this. By the way, at the bottom of that other ridge over there, there's a little creek, which uh, is Willoughby's Run, and another late friend of mine, Will, uh, Woody Christ, who was a licensed battlefield guide, finally discovered after years, we wonder, well, who's Willoughby? And he discovered that, well, an Englishman by the name of Willoughby Winchester had had a little plot down there by the creek, and the, the earlier settlers would call it Willoughby's Run. And so that's a vestige of his presence here. So these early settlers are making do as they can here uh, as, as they would. And again, they're clearing the ground except for woodlots. Woodlots are productive of lit timber that would be used for construction, for crafts, for heating, for cooking and other things. And it was customary that if you had a farm, which most farms here are about 100 acres, uh, that you would have a woodlot. This is actually John Herbst's woodlot. Uh, mistakenly for many years, uh, people would refer to it as McPherson's woodlot. Well, it's not McPherson, it's McPherson, and it's not his woodlot. Mm -hmm. But of course, as we'll see, becomes known as Reynolds Woods. The McPhersons, by the way, had a, a woodlot over there beyond the motel. And you may have heard the news that uh, the Civil War Trust is acquiring that hotel and its motel. And as a result, it should ultimately come into the the Gettysburg National Military Park. That would be the, the McPherson Woods. So we have uh, Mr. McPherson, by the way, the heir in 1858, Edward McPherson, has is, is inherited this property, but he decided not to be a farmer. He decided to go into law, actually studied with Thaddeus Stevens, and actually went into politics, and uh, in 1858 was elected to Congress, and uh, served for two terms, but uh, he would have his ground here uh, with a tenant farmer. John Slentz. John Slentz, about 35 years of age, had three girls and was, was doing the tenant farming here. So again, still the Herbst, this is still McPherson property, but again, John Slentz is going to be attending it. And uh, the years pass, of course, and we're getting into 1861 and the war begins. And many young guys, of course, are going off to war from Gettysburg as well as elsewhere. There had been several threats that the rebels would be coming to Gettysburg. And in fact, Chambersburg is in the Great Valley beyond those mountains, uh, the Great Valley which extends down into the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia, and they were much more vulnerable. And there was actually a raid uh, by Confederate cavalry there, but it sort of became like the boy who cried wolf. The rebels are coming, the rebels are coming, the rebels, well, month after month after month, the rebels never came to Gettysburg. However, the uh, great fear came out in June of 1863 when it appeared that Robert E. Lee uh, was bringing his army north through that great valley, by the way, through the Shenandoah Valley into the Cumberland Valley. And uh, he's up here for several reasons, one of which is to defeat the Union Army. He feels if he can pull them away from the entrenched position that they had down at the Rappahannock River, pull them out in the open, uh, he can defeat them. He also wants to get the bounty of the land here, and there's plenty of bounty in Pennsylvania available to his army. He can feed his army probably for six months after all the livestock that he brings home from Pennsylvania but uh, particularly hoping that the Union Army will come up and at some point he'll defeat them by detail, that is piece by piece as the Union Army trudges up uh, from their position down there in Virginia. This will be a meeting engagement, and by that I mean neither Army commander, neither Robert E. Lee, or the new commander of the Union Army, the Army of the Potomac, which is George Gordon Meade, know when or where the battle's going to be. Gettysburg's a proud little town. It's just beyond the ridge there, and you can see the Lutheran Seminary, Lutheran Seminary had been established, I believe it was 1826, and then would move up onto that ridge line. You can see the 20th century steeple, but to the right you can see the cupola, and that will, of course, draw into play on July 1st as well. So the town of Gettysburg is of no strategic importance. It's not like either army wanted to capture or create some kind of defensive, big defensive position here, although the ground, well, several generals said, ooh, it's good ground for a battle and uh, we'll see how that battle will transpire. Robert E. Lee has most of his men in the valley, again on the other side of that ridge line there, but he will send some east. In fact, a brigade will come through Gettysburg on the 26th of June. And if you look up again in that direction uh, toward the Peace Light, there's the Moomisburg Road up there, and the Moomisburg Road would be the approach of Confederates on the 26th of June. A brigade would come in town, and that brigade would really bring the first shots, if you will, because they were going to come in somewhat like uh, the old westerns when the, 
when the cattlemen would come into town and you know start shooting up the town, scare the daylights out of the townsfolk coming through there, made their demands uh, on the town jubil early uh, for the things that an army would need, medicine and food and blankets and horses and all these things, and then would pass on through. Well, that, of course, terrorized the town. And you can imagine their relief when uh, on the 30th of June, about noon, Union forces show up. The Confederate forces had gone east and would go to York and actually take that town and then some of them would farther, go farther east to the Susquehanna River. But Gettysburg was relieved of that initial Confederate invasion and now very much relieved because Union forces had arrived. And so we're now we're getting close to the battle. What I'd like to do is to introduce some characters here. I guess I ought to first of all, by the way, show you the, the map. This is a, a colorized map showing the farm. And you can see the Cambridgeburg Road, the toll road, by the way, there was a toll keeper down there. There's no evidence that Robert E. Lee's army paid a single penny in <laughs> tolls coming through there. But to cross Willoughby's Run, and you can see that the farm, somewhat rectangular in shape, with this finger, that's where those woods are that I talked about, his wood lots back there. Something else had happened, by the way, in the meantime, I need to talk about 1838. Uh, Thaddeus Stevens, who had spent almost two decades here as an attorney, uh, was a land speculator as well and an entrepreneur. He started an iron works at Caledonia, which was still continuing into the 1860s. And he got into the idea of creating a railroad. The idea, of course, is that we have two major railroads. We've got the Pennsylvania Railroad to the north. You've got the Baltimore, Ohio Railroad to the south. And Gettysburg is sort of in between and not connected. And they knew at the time it was going to be very important to, uh, to the economy of the town that we get connected. So in addition to the road system that I've talked about, uh, he's going to get a charter and try to get fa financing to put a railroad in. Well, most of those charters uh, failed. That is, they could not raise sufficient money and it went belly up. But he had already begun to put the bed of the railroad in. And indeed, uh, it would be heading west through the town. To get up over the mountain, it had to have switchbacks back and forth because the locomotive couldn't go straight up the hill. By the way, you looked on the map of the proposed railroad and, well, some people said it looked like a tapeworm. <laughs> you know, what kind of railroad is this? Uh, anyway, he had put the bed in, which extended to the mountain, and was hoping to get the rails put in, uh, but again, uh, the enterprise went bankrupt. And so what you have is the railroad bed, which slices through the ridges. Remember I talked about the ridges and swales, ridges and swales? Well, on the McPherson, property here, you actually have three places where the ground rises in a ridge and the railroad bed cuts through it. Uh, that will become very important to the battle. The roads are important, the woodlots are important, uh, the railroad bed is going to be important, and these are all features of the ground that you see when we say ground rules the battle. We'll get a better understanding of that. The Union forces that came in June 30th was with John Buford. John Buford was a, uh, he was a professional soldier. He is an experience in the Indian Wars, uh, really a very savvy commander. And he comes in and one of the things that he does is to try to scout out in the distance as to what approaching Confederate forces might be. General Meade had been moving his army in the northeasterly direction toward the uh, Susquehanna River and he had three columns. The left column, or what we sometimes call the left wing, uh, would be headed by John Buford with the column itself under the command of John Fulton Reynolds and we'll be explaining his, his role. But anyway, he gets here and uh, he has directions that uh, if the rebels attack him in force that he's to pull back to Maryland. In other words, not to be defeated in detail. One of the great fears that an army commander has is that pieces of his army would be destroyed before he can converge his army. When you converge your army, you've got strength. When you're spread out, strung out, you've got weakness. But anyway, he will be up here and he will have scouts out through the afternoon and into the evening and night to the west, northwest, to the north, and to the northeast. And they'll notice some things of interest. There is a, about four or five miles north of town, there is a road that cuts through the county east-west, and uh, he would discover that it was infested with rebels. Mm -hmm. And also that night, as they would look off to the west toward Cashtown, 
uh, they could see campfires, and those campfires were not farmers mar with marshmallows roasting. They, they were rebel troops. And so he will actually tell one of his men, uh, he has two lieutenant, well actually they're, they're, they're colonels, but they're his lieutenants, they're his assistants here, each one with a brigade themselves. He'll tell Thomas Devon that you can expect those skirmishers to come three deep in the morning and a rebel push, and uh, they'll, they'll just come booming in the morning. And uh, John Buford uh, understood and he was right about the rebels come booming. The day before, June 30th, when he's coming into town, there was a brigade of Confederates that actually came in, a brigade of about 1,400 men who had come along this road here, the Chambersburg Road, coming east, looking for supplies, shoes especially. And that's not uncommon because Robert E. Lee realized that he had to supply his men by the bounty of Pennsylvania and not have a supply route coming into the rear. It was a chancy thing he did, similar to what Grant would do in the Vicksburg campaign, but it, it worked pretty well. In fact, his men come up to Gettysburg and the area, several counties around here, and are, are getting much. But anyway, that brigade under Johnston Pettigrew about noon comes to the ridge line over there. Uh, we call that ridge line two different, by two different names. Where the seminary is, we call it the Seminary Ridge, and it extends north and what we call Oak Ridge. Oak Ridge and Seminary Ridge is one geological feature, understand that. But after the railroad track went in and the, and the campus of the seminary was established, they began to call it by two different names, Seminary Ridge to the south and Oak Ridge to the north. Johnson Pettigrew gets there in town and he looks off and he sees the evidence of Union forces coming in and he's got a directive, in fact, Lee has issued the directive, don't start a general engagement until I can get the army together. And his army still is pretty, pretty well spread out. So Johnson Pettigrew, by the way, He's going to have about 1,400 men. Uh, Devon will about have about 2,500 men. So you can understand why appropriately he decides to ship back. He has to actually go eight miles west and, and to a place called Ca Cashtown, uh, where he'll be waiting for the next day. Now that night, the several generals get together and start talking. And in fact, according to, to General Heath, uh, he actually gets permission. He got word from Lee ordering me to get the shoes. Remember I said shoes especially. There was no shoe factory in Gettysburg, by the way. But I will say there were three tanneries in town, and uh, it was a county seat town, so you could expect some shoes. Ordering me to get the shoes even if I encountered some resistance. So encountering resistance is expected. Uh, a general engagement is to be avoided. Well, he's going to come and call them the next morning from about eight miles west of here. Johnson, uh, Harry Heath, let me introduce him by the way. Harry Heath uh, is one of nine division commanders Lee will have in his army. Lee has uh, three corps and each corps has three divisions. Uh, Harry Heath is commanding the one that's coming in this direction. And at that meeting among the generals the night before, someone had said, let's go get those shoes. Well, you need to understand the Confederates often use the uh, Union for their supplies. <laughs> And they would often take whatever they wanted, and cannons and other things, and, and supply depots, and also in garrisons. But sometimes they got shoes off the feet of Yankees. And so that may have been bravado, whoever said it, that they were going to come and whip whatever Yankees that were found in this and take their boots. And in fact, that had happened the 26th of June when the earlier route of General Gordon coming through here had run into some resistance. Actually, an emergency militia was all that Pennsylvania could put together at that point but they stripped them of their shoes and boots, and that perhaps is going to happen. So we have the development in the morning of July 1st, and about seven o'clock from the cupola, remember the seminary cupola over there, the green cap cupola over there? Uh, there was a, a young officer, Aaron Jerome, a lieutenant, who's looking out to the west, and what does he spot? He spots Harry Heath's men. They will be in column. A column is four wide, <clears throat> and as long as needed, <laughs> In fact, uh, with a division, that's a very long, that's good, miles and miles long, coming in this direction. And indeed, uh, he would uh, send out the alert, and John Buford has positioned his men in an interesting fashion. First of all, he had vedettes. Vedettes, guys, from the Latin to see, and vedettes are out each of the roads, the spokes of the wheels, if you will, from the hub of Gettysburg going out, and he will be watching, and, and uh, about 7.30, uh, the vedettes uh, out the Chambersburg Road several miles uh, under, uh, there's a Lieutenant Marcellus Jones of Chicago, 8th Illinois Cavalry, who will spot that column also. 
And what he will do is uh, take a carbine from uh, one of his sergeants and lay it across the fence rail. And he says, let me start the ball. That is the first shot, so about 7.30. It's a little misleading again because when the 26th of June rebels came in, there was actually a U Union soldier uh, who was killed here, uh, William Sando. So first shots at Gettysburg hadn't happened July 1st. They happened actually June 26th. But the first shots of the battle would begin at 7.30 in the morning. And there's actually a marker. You can go out the, the road there and be able to uh, come to a, uh, a marker on your right about two, two miles out. It's, a, it's at a, a Whistler Ridge, or sometimes called Knoxland Ridge, on the right. Very dangerous place on the highway, by the way, to, to get out, so I don't recommend you do it without great, great, great caution. But that's where the first shots will be fired. And what John Buford has done, back to John, he has dismounted his men. He's told them, uh, do not be exposed with your horses. Now, you know, of course, that the three branches of the military will be infantry, cavalry, and artillery. There will be some artillery, actually one battery, with uh, John Buford that day. But he doesn't want the enemy to know who he is. Cavalry are more mobile because they have horses, but they're also bigger targets, and they usually don't have the strength that infantry does. And so by putting his men out on those ridge lines uh, and firing uh, from different points, He's confusing the rebels as to what they're facing. So Harry Heath will immediately, by the way, cautiously and, and properly move his men out of column. You're very vulnerable in column, especially if the Union has cannon, which they do, because you're sort of in this position uh, uh, along the road where you can easily be hit and not be able to fire back. But if you move from column into line of battle, going east and west, or in this case, south and north of the road, uh, you can present a, a, a face. And so there will be two brigades coming in. Uh, let's move around here so you can look off in the distance and sort of to imagine it. First of all, I want you to see barely, but you can see the a silo, the tip of a silo out there. That silo is on another ridge line out there. And uh, he will have men uh, on that ridge line. He'll have them spread out and they will be firing. The uh, rebels don't know whether they're bushwhackers or maybe home guard or militia or some detail of the Union Army, what they are. And indeed, what Gen General Buford will also do was to take his six guns. He has one battery, six guns. He'll put two across the road, have two on this side of the road here, and another two on the other side of that wood lot. And in doing so, he spread out his battery. And so not only are the Confederates coming under infantry fire, and they're not sure exactly, well, it's, it, it seems like infantry fire. Actually, we know it's cavalry. But the way they're firing and the fact that the horses, what they would do is take a squad of four, one becomes the horse holder, and three dismount. And they're firing carbines rather than rifles. All the sounds about the same. They don't quite have the range with a carbine that you would have with a rifle. But the advantage you have with a carbine is you can load it quicker. He does not have repeaters, but these men do have carbines which are, are loaded uh, through the breech and not through the muzzle. And so, again, Harry Heath is going to be very cautious. He has one brigade going to the south of the road in line of battle, and that's going to be uh, Archer's Brigade. General Archer from Tennessee will be commanding that. And then he'll have another brigade, which will be north of the road coming in, and that's going to be Joe Davis. Joe Davis is uh, related to uh, Jefferson Davis and apparently got his position largely because of political pool, not military savvy. But the South, by the way, is having the same problem the North is, getting enough commanders who uh, have military training. And so you have to bring guys in who are learning on the spot, and uh, Joe Davis would pretty much be, be that. And so we have the situation arrive, arising, and about this time, uh, it's about 9.30 that they're approaching, and they're slowly approaching, and what happens is Buford's men, as soon as the rebels are getting closer to the top of the ridge, they scurry back to the next ridge hidden. And so still the rebels are not sure who they're, they're facing, but they're coming slowly. What John Buford is trying to do is to buy time. He's giving up ground. This is not a defense in depth because he has no depth. His men are strung in a big fan going to the west, the northwest, the north, and the northeast, sprung around. And he doesn't have a lot of men, but he has a lot of savvy. 
He's cunning, and what he does, again, is to trick the rebels as to who they're going to be facing. And they're coming on cautiously. They don't want to fall into an ambush. But again, time is being bought. This is a, an illustration from about 9.30 in the morning, my map, in which you had, based upon, a, by the way, a map that was done by an engineer who was with the Army of the Potomac. The Chambersburg Pike, Willoughby's Run, out to our west, and uh, the woodlot. We're standing right here at the corner of the woodlot. And you can see how he's got his guns, his cannons, and spread out, and how he's got men forward. And we have Archer and Davis, both under Harry Heath, that are advancing from the west, advancing slowly, advancing cautiously. But John Buford will also send word back to the nearest infantry. And remember, he's heading ahead of a column coming up, and that column, the left wing of the Union Army, is going to be commanded um, by John Reynolds. By 10 o'clock, it's going to look more like this. Actually, what's happened is that there's going to be a div dividing of Archer's brigade and Davis's Confederate brigade, partly because Archer is seeking to use the advantage of the trees. Trees give you cover and concealment as you move. And by the way, as we'll see, don't imagine it as it appears today. Back then, what would happen with these woodlots is that the farmers would cut off the lower branches as they needed wood, and they'd let their cattle roam freely through it, and so the wood lots had more of an appearance of a picnic grove. You could walk easily through it. Today we have no cattle roaming through there and we're not cutting down lower branches and we're not using herbicides and so as a result it gets pretty thick uh, underneath. But that's not how it was at the time of the battle. Archer coming in here and then Davis actually will begin to move away from the road also uh, partly because of the terrain and advantage that he will get. As they're moving forward, Union forces are rushing to this position and they're coming from that direction. They're coming up the Emmitsburg Road under John Reynolds and they're going to be leaving the Emmitsburg Road right near where the Kadori homestead is, rushing across the fields at a double quick, <laughs> carrying 40 pounds. <laughs> I'm not going to illustrate the distance they came and all. They were pretty exhausted as they came up. But John Fulton Reynolds has ordered those men up. He is the first corps commander and he's also the left wing commander. So he immediately commands his own corps, but he also is responsible for the 11th Corps and the 3rd Corps. And he will send word back that he's going to try to reach the heights beyond the town before the rebels. Now what heights beyond the town is he speaking of, but these heights where we're on. You got the ridge line there, Seminary Ridge, Oak Ridge, McPherson's Ridge. He has a little farther to go than the rebels do, but he's not under fire. And he's hoping that John Buford will be able to slow down, as he is, the advance of the rebels coming in here while John Reynolds moves men into position. Now I need to pause here a moment because the commanding general, the new general of the Union Army, who is uh, George Gordon Meade, has come up with a plan for July 1st. And it's called the Pipe Creek Plan. In fact, he'll send a circular out. I think it goes out about 9 o'clock in the morning from headquarters down at Tawnytown, Maryland. And the idea is that you have three columns, and each column has depth to it, another core behind it, and each column has cavalry to the front. If any one of those columns comes under fire from a force of the enemy, they're to notify the ones nearby and then pull back to a place in Maryland called Pipe Creek. We don't know, but don't think that Reynolds ever got those orders. Although, quite frankly, we do know that Colonel Dickinson from headquarters came the night of June 30th to Moritz Tavern, Marsh Creek, where John Reynolds was, and conferred with him. And it very might, well might be that John Reynolds got whiff of the Pipe Creek plan at that point, even though he probably never got the actual orders. John Reynolds has told his chief lieutenant, that's Abner Doubleday, that he's going to fight the rebels wherever he finds them. And what John Reynolds is going to do is commit the Union Army to fight here regardless of the fact that George Meade has in plan another position that would be at Pipe Creek in Maryland. So John Reynolds is rushing men forward. He will send, under Wadsworth's division, men to the north of the road. And that's going to be, uh, again, James Wadsworth, a New Yorker, is going to be uh, commanding the two brigades coming in. Wadsworth will have uh, Lysander Cutler, who is the brigade commander to the north. So you're going to have Cutler facing Davis. And again, they're under James Wadsworth, who is not the sharpest knife in the drawer. But uh, again, he's a political general, as, as many others are. 
Cutler there will be there. Cutler will come across, and in the fields beyond where the truck is, and the fields out there, there will be an engagement initially between Cutler's brigade and Davis's brigade. And in our map here, you see how Davis has come and somewhat detached himself from the road, but is encompassing the position that Cutler would have. And Cutler is going to find himself in, 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 in an awkward situation across those open fields because his position is going to be enveloped and overwhelmed. And in the meantime, Archer's brigade is coming through the woods right here, and Meredith's brigade is going to be coming from the Union side. Let's talk about Solomon Meredith a little bit. He's commanding one of the crack units, brigades in the entire Union Army forces. Indeed, uh, as they come in, they have already gained their reputation on other battlefields as the Iron Brigade. And they will be coming right across here, and John Reynolds personally at the front is going to be putting them into position into these woods right here. And as he's coming up, he puts one regiment in. Those guys, remember, are hustling at the double quick across those fields, gets one regiment in. John Reynolds, who's mounted, is rushing back and forth, ordering where they will go. And uh, suddenly, something tragic will occur. We're going to walk down here and, and understand what that tragedy will be for the Union forces. John Reynolds is from nearby Lancaster, Pennsylvania. He's a Pennsylvanian. He doesn't like the idea of Lee rampaging through his, his state and the southern Pennsylvania where he, he'd grown up. And again, uh, wants to really hit the Confederates hard. He's also upset because he's been in battle after battle before, and the Union forces usually cut and run <laughs> pretty quickly. He doesn't want to see that happen here. And again, he will commit the Union forces to fight here. What he'll do, again, is Cutler's Brigade to the north, and down here will come Meredith's Brigade into these very woods that we see behind us. But remember, the undergrowth is not going to be there. You would be able to see 50, 60 yards easily through the woods uh, at the time of the battle. As he's ordering men forward, he's seeing another regiment coming up, and he turns in his saddle to direct them where they go, and he's shot down. One of the answers, disputes that I'm not going to answer is, is who shot him, <laughs> because several claim to, and it was generally thought to be a sharpshooter, although in that era, if a, uh, a highly respected general was down, they always wanted it to be a sharpshooter. They didn't want it to be just a random volley. I don't know whether it was a volley or not, but there are enough early accounts that claim it was a sharpshooter, although several different sharpshooters claim it was them. We're not quite sure, but he's dead by the time he hits the ground immediately goes in at the back of his head and gets into his brain. He hits the ground and, and John Reynolds is dead. He will be the highest ranking general to die in this battle. And again, that's going to be a shockeroo when John Reynolds is down. His last words were, drive those rebels out of those woods! And his men will do that. Archer's brigade that's coming through those woods will encounter the Iron Brigade coming against them. And one of the rebels will make the interesting comment. He says, them ain't militia. We've seen these boys before. Those are black-hatted fellers. He knows them, the Iron Brigade. They have earned their reputation on prior battlefields. And my goodness, I don't know whether they, the men were all aware of what had happened to John Reynolds and maybe were trying to redeem his death somehow, but they will, Yankees will charge to those woods and drive Archer back. In fact, his brigade will be driven not only back through the woods, but back across Willoughby's Run. And the Yankees will still be pushing them. In fact, General Archer himself will be captured. He'll be captured uh, uh, on the west side of Willoughby's Run, which is the first time General Lee has had any of his generals captured in battle. This is developing to be a pretty significant battle, even though General Lee has said, don't start a general engagement. And General Meade is not even here, and he's waiting in Tawnytown as messages are coming back. And of course, you can imagine when he gets the message that Reynolds is down, how anxious he will be. Well, more reinforcements are coming in on both sides, on McPherson Ridge. By the way, there are two ridges here, which we call McPherson Ridge. One that we're standing on is to the east. There's also a west one, and I'd like to get over there, and we're going to take the vote at this time, whether we go through the fields with the ticks, or go through the swath with poison ivy, or whether we drive to the other side. This is a democracy, or whether we stay here.
Let me explain just briefly here. Reinforcements are coming in from the Union side. We had two brigades already, Cutler's Brigade. They have fallen back. They have fallen back into those woods and in fact some even toward into the town. On this side, the Union is doing well. North of us, they're doing poorly. Davis's Mississippians will swing around and see that they have a great opportunity because they're coming in on the flank, the end of the line, to this brigade down here. However, they will also encounter something called a railroad cut. Remember those cuts I talked about? Well, uh, you will see where this, the lights are. That's a bridge that we've put in today uh, over one of the cuts, the center cut. There's actually a, what we call a western, the middle, and the eastern cut. As the Mississippians are coming around, oh my, you can understand the advantage they have. They're coming in off the high ground, they're coming in on the flank, and uh, they're facing little resistance. However, the Union forces here will <laughs> rally under a gentleman by the name of Rufus Dawes. Rufus Dawes is from Wisconsin, and Rufus Dawes has his six Wisconsin in reserve back there. Typically, you don't want to put all your forces in immediately because there will be moments of crisis where you need to plug a hole or something. He will observe what's happening over there and realize the dire danger. And he will order, on his own initiative, his men to shift out of the reserve position and to rush that railroad cut. They'll rush up there in a very dramatic moment. Hard to find a more dramatic moment at Gettysburg. You've got the Mississippians in that railroad cut, although the height of the railroad cut varies depending on whether you're on the ridge or the swale. At some places there's no cut at all. Some places it comes up to your breast. In many places it's so high you can't see out of it. Well, they'll rush over their famous moments in which there'll be tug of war for flags, uh, for the Confederate flags, but there's several hundred Confederates actually will be trapped in that. They thought it was to their advantage to be there. It turned out to be their disadvantage. In fact, as Dawes men come up looking down into the railroad cut, it's like, I've never shot fish in a barrel. That's the expression. I don't know how that works, but that's the kind of thing that would have been easy. So obviously Davis's men, many will raise their hands and surrender. And they will then, the ones who cannot, can get away, will switch back over to the far ridge that I talked about. And so uh, at this point, it's looking pretty good for the Yankees. Even though Cutler has fallen back, that problem has been resolved by the heroism of Rufus Dawes. And now the Iron Brigade has done well here. And now more reinforcements are coming in for the Union side. Stone's Brigade and Biddle's Brigade. Biddle's Brigade will come in south of the woodlot. Stone's Brigade will come in to the north and actually will take a position to the right of the barn and try to manage a connection. See, the connection had been lost between Cutler here and Meredith. They're going to try to stem the gap there by uh, moving into position, but it's going to be very vulnerable as they do so. We're going to be walking down and we're going to be going to the barn and uh, fair walking as we get out there. And then as we get there, we'll talk about the positioning of the the uh, brigade by Ray, Ray, the Stone, Stone's uh, um, Bucktail Brigade, as they call them. Um, by the way, I should say, there was a Bucktail Regiment which was recruited from central Pennsylvania earlier in the war and it had been such a successful thing. And they said, you have to prove yourself worthy of being in this regiment by being able to bring down a buck, uh, a, a male deer, you know, the antler and all that. And uh, so, of course, young men, the game was on. Everyone trying to show that they were worthy of it. Uh, it was such a recruiting success that later on Pennsylvania said, well, if we can bring a regiment in with that, we'll bring a whole brigade in, 4,000 men. And so they put out the appeal again and got more men coming in. But you can imagine the guys in the first unit, the Bucktails, were very upset that others were coming in claiming to be Bucktails. And they called, were called the bogus Bucktails. <laughs> but we'll see. They will not prove to be bogus here. They were Well, we're on the uh, homestead of the McPherson Farm, historic barn, uh, an orchard which we've somewhat simulated here, not much of one, and the home, the house would be over there. Originally the house 
was toward the old lane which connected the Hagerstown Road with the Shippensburg Road. Uh, when the toll road in, went in, it ended up there house was on the other side of the barn. That's not your preferred way of doing it in the 19th century. You want your barn toward the back and the house toward the front. But this is where it would be. Again, we're talking about another brigade which is moving into position now uh, here at this homestead. This is a photograph, by the way, uh, done in the early 1880s of this homestead. The, ho the barn that you see uh, to your left, to the right of the picture, photograph is taken from about where the intersection is out there where the signal light is and you can see the several the house and the several outbuildings it's a it's a notable uh, uh, fairly uh, well-to-do farm by the way the Confederates were astounded when they came into Pennsylvania because they said the barns here are bigger than their houses and homes back there more magnificently built and you can see the fine stonework uh, which is in this barn I mentioned again that in the woods would be Meredith's uh, brigade, Stonewall Brigade. Actually now in those woods would be Cutler's Brigade and in this area here trying to connect it would be very awkwardly the position of Roy Stone. Uh, Roy Stone uh, is going to be positioning his men with sort of an elbow. Here's Colonel Stone that is coming out here into the fields and bending back. We're actually going to go around to the uh, shaded part of the barn there to see most for most of it but I did want you to get a sense from the higher ground here before we go around to the barn and we'll see how Roy Stone will put his men in position to try to again get a contiguous line which will stretch between the two woodlots. This again is the historic barn. The, the stonework is totally original. We've had to replace the siding and the uh, roof shingles for a while. You can see the actual beams and see how they were actually hand hewn here. This goes in very early, this barn, in the early part of the 19th century. And from here we can get a better angle of the middle cut where the, today's bridge goes over and beyond it uh, where they, uh, the, the, the urgent uh, effort was made to stop the uh, approach of the Mississippians. And this is my map from about 11 o'clock. And by the way, uh, for whoever cares. I do have the support going in for Rufus Dawes here. I just haven't identified them. You can see that they, they're turning and, and uh, crossing. Uh, so not only Dawes, but others will be involved in the action to try to, to repel uh, Davis's brigade. Several hundred will be captured in the, in the uh, railroad cut. Others will flee back over there. So by 11 o'clock, things are looking pretty good from the federal side, other than the fact that John Reynolds is dead. Who's going to be taking over for John Reynolds is going to be Abner Doubleday. Abner Doubleday uh, probably didn't invent baseball, but that's another story. But he did do well here. Uh, Abner Doubleday will be the senior ranking division commander uh, in the First Corps. And uh, he has been told, by the way, not personally briefed by Reynolds, but Reynolds says, I will hold this road. You must hold the one there. That's the Fairfield or Hagerstown Road. And so uh, I'll show you this map from about 3 o'clock. And the red, again, reminds you of Confederate forces and the blue, the Yankee forces. <laughs> you can see that the rebels are coming now in strength. We have uh, actually two different corps, the third corps and the second corps, divisions from each, which are approaching here. And you can see poor, poor uh, Roy Stone's position here. The, the pink on the map represents where you are at the barn. And you can see he's going to try to hold on. But as you look out and imagine Daniel's brigade, Davis's brigade again, and now Brockenbrough's brigade coming up there, uh, this is going to be a hot place to be. And at a certain point, he's going to have to order uh, the retreat of his men. Uh, one of the poignant stories is the 143rd Pennsylvania and a monument which is out there near where the intersection is of a color bearer. This color bear, by the way, his photograph is here. He's actually not only accounted in the Union stories of this battle, but the Confederates as well. Because as Roy Stone gives the direction that his men are to fall back, the color bear doesn't want to fall back. He takes his fist and he shakes his fist. He goes back a few yards and he shakes his fist again. Goes back a few yards, shakes his fist again, and you can see uh, depicted he will die here on this battlefield but members of his unit wanting to honor his courage 
And again, Rebel accounts will describe seeing this incredibly, well, they didn't want to shoot him down because he was so courageous, but he was the color bearer, and you always want to shoot down the color bearer. So he will be pulling back. Such that this portion of the battle, uh, the first shots on McPherson Ridge, will be coming to an end uh, about 3 o'clock. Rebels eventually will have to drive through here to the seminary, and that's going to be challenging. Uh, there's going to be a, 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 a lot of affliction on the part of Confederates trying to get through the open grounds because the Yankees have set up on that ridge line in the distance a line of cannons which will be firing into the faces of those rebels as they cross the field. So the first shot stories from, again, first shot fired at 7.30 in the morning till shots being fired into the early afternoon completes our story here in a way. But I do want to uh, let you do two things. I, I always vet the group. I've been watching you very carefully, even as you've been watching me. And I want to make sure that uh, all of you are reputable people, and I believe that you are. This building, this barn, will have been used as a hospital. July 1st, 2nd, 3rd, and 4th will be a hospital. The Pennsylvania Bank barn, as you're probably aware, has a lower level, primarily stables on the lower level, and then a loft approached from the bank, hence the name bank barn, from the other side. Uh, I'm going to let you have a solemn moment. Uh, I'm not going to interpret as you, you do so, but I want to allow you into the lower level and to imagine uh, those men who are lying on the ground. There's no floor in, in, the, in the stable area. And imagine them day after day trying to be attended to here. And so I'd ask you to do it solemnly because this is a very special place. All the battlefield is hallowed ground, as our 16th president said, but when we get to a place like this, an actual location. As you look in the barn, by the way, you'll see some fire retardant systems. We put those in. You'll see some iron girders, which we put in so the barn will hold up. But you will certainly see the original uh, beams and the original stonework. And then when you're all finished, just step back out. I want to show you a portion of a map which was done after the battle. A gentleman by the name of Elliot uh, went around because of all the burials that were being done. All the soldiers were initially put in trench graves. These are very shallow graves side by side by side by side. And he tried to identify where those would be because, well, we have a battlefield of easily 10 square miles and they're spread out here, there, and everywhere. The sector where we are, and I've cop recopied the section of the, of the Elliot map shows where the barn is. The barn is here, and you can see the, the corner of the woods where we started. All these slash marks here are dead soldiers that have been buried. Primarily Confederate soldiers here, but also Union soldiers, many of whom were buried right where, right where we started, and others in different places, including in the field and across Willoughby's Run. Each little mark, one grave, Union, Confederate, Union, Union, Confederate, Confederate. This is a burial ground. Uh, we don't know that all the bodies have ever been retrieved. We don't have complete records. About 11,000 would die from this battle. We say about 7,000 killed in action. They never would leave their place where they fought. Another three to 4,000 would be mortally wounded. That means that they would never leave Gettysburg. Uh, Abner Doubleday, in writing about this, especially the Pennsylvania boys, some of whom I've talked about here, uh, when they came in here, uh, they said, we came to stay. They weren't going to run. But as Doubleday also points out, many of them did stay. They never did leave Gettysburg, but would be buried here. 
I don't want to leave on too sad a note though. There is a final thing I'd like to share with you and that is around the corner. This would be a place of course where not only visitors would come such as yourself in the 151 years since but soldiers would return now as veterans and they would put monuments in. I talked about the 143rd Pennsylvania and you've seen obviously many others. We have well about 1,320 most of which are our uh, regimental mon monuments here on this battlefield. When the uh, dedication of their monument was put in, two Union veterans the next day came back to this barn. Uh, they were clearly talking about what had happened here, clearly talking about where their comrades had, had, had fallen, and did something that we're not going to allow you to do. I guess you could call it graffiti. They actually scratched their initials into the building the day after the dedication of their monument. If any of you happen to be veterans of this battle, I give you permission to do that <laughs> at the site where you fought, but I don't think that anyone is. Let's go around the corner and see, and I'll come back and close the door later. need to come up close to see Pennsylvania volunteers and their, their initials that they put in here. We've actually been able to identify who they are, the actual soldiers who were here. But that scratching is scratching done by guys who did fight here and saw their comrades die here. As you go back, you can go back the way you came <laughs> to the barn uh, or you can take the tick filled fields, but I don't recommend that. Do ask that even those you didn't go through the tall grass, then each of you check yourselves out tonight. Just quickly about ticks, tiny little insects, they do not bite, they do not sting, but what they do is for about 36 hours they wander around your body to find a nice soft cozy place to burrow in and they will do it. And in fact you probably will not even be aware that they're doing it until if they bring Lyme disease. And I had a friend just two days ago who uh, reported receiving Lyme disease and that can really be debilitating aching and problems that can last months. But again, if you check yourself out, shower tonight, bathe tonight, whatever, and uh, with children, just check them out also, even in the, under the scalp. But I don't know that you've got any. We often get them here and don't think too much about them because we're cautious. I want you to be cautious too. Thank you for being with me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.